the agenda for this evening for me here in uh, Sweden earlier in other time zones. So maybe lunch if you're over in the US. So the agenda, yes. So I talk about beta every time for people who have never been to one of our events. So they get an idea of who we are, what we do, who I am, what my background is. Give people a better feel uh, for what we're gonna be talking about. And then I talk about how we listen and the background to why we do these events. Then I do a series of announcements just so people know what's up, either around how we listen or beta, um, how you can find content later, et cetera, et cetera. And then part two in conversation with Kevin Erickson. So for those who I've never met before, my name is Mark Brown. I'm the founder and CEO of Beta. This is a Canadian accent. I uh, spent 18 years living in London. Then a handful of years ago, I moved to Stockholm, Sweden, where I live now. And as I say every time, I think it's super important when you uh, get new perspectives from people, especially in and around music, that it's good to get a feel for people's backgrounds and how they, what perspective they have on the music ecosystem. And that includes listening to me interview someone. So very important to know, I started in, at a small indie label in Canada in the 90s, pre-internet. Um, then I moved to the UK and I worked at Creation Records, which is one of the UK's most uh, famous and important indie labels in the 90s. And this was about the time that digital music started going. I left there, I worked in another indie with the founder of um, the guy who started Creation. And I, that's where I started doing radio promotion. So same as press, but instead you reach out to radio, radio stations and try to get records played. And unlike say maybe in the US, in the UK, that's still a very important job. It's considered not somewhat cool. Like you can have a lot of influence. Um, there's a lot less stations, so it's more consolidated. And then I left there and I became, uh, I started my own boutique radio promotion company where we did radio and TV. And I did that for about 10, 15 years. And in the middle of that was when it was all starting to happen with sharing audio files, pre-release, when you're collaborating or promoting your music before it ends up in a record shop or on streaming services. And so that's when we started Beta. So what is Beta for people who don't know? Beta is the platform that enables sending and receiving of digital audio in a clean, simple, and secure way. Built for everyone working with music today. And what does that mean in practice? Fast secure audio sharing. But what does that really mean? Because there's lots of ways to share audio, right? Well, Beat is unique because we take advantage of audiophiles unique properties, of which there are three we like to highlight, and which you all should know about. So metadata, there's metadata that you need when you submit your music to a streaming platform, but there's also metadata that lives in the files that you send around, you swap your masters, demos, all that kind of stuff. And that's called embedded file metadata. And Beta reads that information. So you upload to Beta, we extract all the metadata out, allow you to update it, and then it's stored in the file. So what you see on the screen is what's embedded in your files. We work with file formats and audio quality. So as you know, audio files have uh, lossless or lossy properties. And with Beta, you can upload in one file format and then click a button and share in another. So saves you having tons of different file formats for your album sitting in a Dropbox or something like that. And then streamability, the key with audio files is you can stream them. You can listen as they're downloaded, as they're played. And so we have fast yet secure streaming, meaning you can't rip our streaming links, which is super important. We're essentially experts in this area. So if you want to know more, Jamie will throw a link in the chat to a white paper a research document we uh, we published last year, the first one ever on the state of music share. So if anybody wants to learn a bit more about what other people do and what their preferences are, there's a ton, tons of great information there. So go have a look and download it if you want. And this here on the screen is our mission statement. You know, the, the mission that drives our company. 
So our goal is to provide artists and their teams, so the people making music and the people working with them, with the tools and knowledge to move their careers forward. So the first one's pretty simple. Beat is a tool for sending and receiving digital audio. You can check that box, job done. But we realized over time that a lot of people are also looking for knowledge. And so that's why we started How We Listen. And How We Listen started as this interview series on web that we still do, we release one a week, where we interview people about how they find, listen, discover and explore and experience new music. And this came out of the fact that, say, a couple of years ago when we started doing these interviews, I certainly felt, and everybody, a lot of us in the company, we all got a bit frustrated that you'd read these articles or you go to talks and people would be saying, oh, well, all you need to do is just, you know, upload your music to a streaming platform and then the algorithm picks it up. It does, the algorithm does its work. And, or, or that, oh yeah, if you get on a playlist, like basically, you just need to get on a playlist and you're golden. And, you know, say three years ago is whatever, 40,000 tracks uploaded a day to Spotify. Now it's 100,000. And even then this wasn't true, but now more so it's not true that there's a lot more that goes into how people find and listen and experience music, myself, anybody on this call. It's much different than just these simple ways to connect. And so let me give you some examples of nuances, the way people find and listen to music. So the How We Listen series, we just interview tons and tons of different people. So if you ever want to get in touch with a couple of good suggestions, we're always up for that. But Carrie from Music Mismatch, they're saying, I prefer to mindfully consume music, buy an album, listen to it a few dozen times when it becomes something to cherish. It's hard to do that with stream music. So if you think back to those, <laughs> what I was saying before about algorithms, this, that, and the other thing, there are people that don't actually even want to listen to stream music, not because they're anti-internet, but more because they have a different way of experiencing music. And I think that's very, very, very important to incorporate into how you take an artist or yourself as an artist, how you go from being just creating music for the first time to getting those first few fans and building an audience. So again, it's not even just about how to get attention on stream platforms. It's like what happens in the physical world. Now, we also started another series, I believe it was earlier this year called Method to My Music. And what we wanted to do with this interview series was get people talking more about uh, the creation of music, what the, you, you know, what the, what the nuances are of creating music, not just about which plugins they use or you know which DAW they use, but more about the ins and outs of collaboration and what that means because collaboration is so important now and to be fair, a lot easier. So Samnuri, they were saying like, we had some demos very, very early on that got flipped to public on SoundCloud. And this is funny, I've heard about this before. Um, and then they say downloaded and published on YouTube before we ever released everything, anything. That kind of sucked. And the reason I generally like to, you know, find a quote that has a bit to do with security is because I think people have sort of forgotten, or they think, oh, security is not important, or now that everybody listens to streaming, no one's worried about torrents. But I think these kind of quotes highlight artists and their wish to make sure that when they present their work they do it when they want to and that's a lot about what leaks and stuff though that's when it caused problems things get out there that they don't want to get out there and i think it's very important to think about and so i thought that quote this quote was great for that and then our third latest series is a bit different and what it is is it's about uh it's people who work say more in the in the business of music who write a longer article about their sort of area expertise and what they work on and maybe for about certain maybe buzzwords you've heard about that you don't know anything about and so people can learn a bit more about all these different aspects and we're going to talk about this in a bit like how big and complex the music ecosystem is and so any new pieces of information is always helpful. So we just published a new one I believe a week ago we'll drop that in the chat but the one from last month 
He's by Kieran. And he wrote about why creators are key to improving the industry's metadata and how to get them to engage. And so again, I was talking about metadata. You hear about it all the time. Just because you hear about it doesn't mean everybody knows everything, uh, nor does it mean everybody's doing something about it. So again, super important. I will throw the link in the chat. And here's a quote. So Kieran's saying, we found that, the, let me just, I'm gonna move my window. We've got to found that, <laughs> we found that the data visualization and the way we're translating all this credit activity, so credits like who wrote what, in all one place from every platform has become the catalyst to get people to engage with the credits. And so something I think about on this front is, I don't know if anybody's seen, I like I use Spotify a lot, and the lyrics. So now the lyrics are in there. So the idea that we went from a world where you listen to a vinyl LP and then it got into a CD and there was a CD booklet and then it goes to digital and then there's no information. It, it sort of hasn't ended there. It seems to be all coming back. And I think credits are an example of that, that the lyrics now on Spotify are so accessible and so should the credits be, but getting all that information into sort of centralized repositories as a lot of these companies are doing is uh, super difficult work, and, but also really uh, commendable. So that links in the chat. Um, but then how we listen live, like why are we doing it? You know, what is it? So we do these series, it's all a written word. Uh, but then we thought, oh, you know what would be cool is if we could have someone on who could talk more about who they are, what they do, and then really get into the nuances. And we felt that that was impossible to do just over a, uh, not a boring interview, but over a text-based interview. So that's why we started How We Listen. It's a good way for people to get together. Generally, people here ask awesome questions. The chat's always pretty active. Um, so yeah, that's why. And I think this is number 18, maybe. So we've been doing it a while now. Um, Super important, I always mention this. Um, no one who does anything on these calls gets paid, we don't pay speaker fees or anything. But what we do do is give a little money to an organization that's close to our heart in London called Maytree, which is a house for uh, people when they're feeling suicidal. And of course, this kind of um, organization doesn't need, doesn't need any introduction. Everybody has mental health issues. It's just important. So if you don't have an organization in your area, feel free to give to Matri, just Google it. Um, but it's important to us. And I love to bring it up every time um, because hopefully it's important to you. My site where I have links to getting a hold of me and my Twitter and all that kind of stuff and my blog on Beta. So that's there. I usually have more to say in this area, but I don't today. Now, this part's all about how everybody digests info because everybody has their own way of finding out about stuff. So we have a Facebook group, find that. Then you can get notifications about new articles and things that are getting posted and all that kind of stuff. It's all in there if you like that kind of stuff. YouTube channel, we post all of these interviews with a light edit so you're not bored out of your mind or hear me coughing. Um, but it's become substantially more advanced. So let's see, what do we do? Uh, you sign up for the event, you, you either come to the event or even if you don't come to the event, you get a link afterwards to a, to a stream on Beta. Then we send out the YouTube video. Then it goes out as a podcast as available on all your podcast platforms. So even if you don't wanna come to an event, you can't make it, just sign up. You'll get the links to get reminded and you can watch it anywhere you want in your own time. Uh, that's why I also like to say you don't need to sit there and take notes because you can find it again later and listen. So just relax, sit back, ask some questions, have some fun. And then you ever want to get a hold of me, just hit my website or website. That sounds so 90s. But um, yes, viznomics.com or here's my email address. Hit me up on LinkedIn. It's always a good place to get me. The messaging on LinkedIn is pretty good. Um, and I think that's it. So yeah, if anybody has any questions, throw them in the chat. Georgetown University, nice. Uh, hello, NYC. Uh, Kevin, how's it going? Nice to see you. It's good to be here. Um, it's gone okay, all things considered. Um, 
you know it's a busy you were time complaining about the weather i, I was um it's, <laughs> i i don't know we've just been enjoying such a lovely autumn and now it's suddenly it, it like winter sort of hit all at once um but um I don't know. I love the city. It's a good place to be, and it, and and I have to remember that when it. And, when it and where are you? You're in Washington D.C. I'm in Washington D.C. Right, yeah. right, yeah. Um, and so this like, there's just sort of a mad scramble to right now, get as much done before the end of the year before um, Congress adjourns for the holidays, and um, so that's that's been taking up a lot of our attention. Um, here. and when, so let's let, I, I'm going to ask one question on that front and then we'll roll right back to the start. But so Congress, when, when's the, when do they go on holiday? Well, uh, they have, it's, they have a, a date that's scheduled, but, uh, because there are some, um, must pass things that have to happen before the end of the year, it's kind of in flux. Um, like they, um, you know, sometimes they barely make it before Christmas, or sometimes they even have had to come back after Christmas if 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 they oh, don't. Oh, okay, okay. Funding bills done, so we don't entirely know yet. So, okay, so then that that makes zero sense if no one knows who you are and what what you do. So, who are you and what do you do? Uh, <laughs> and then that'll uh, make that response will make sense. Sure. So, I'm I'm Kevin Erickson. I I direct Future of Music Coalition, which is a nonprofit that has been based out of out of DC for uh, over 20 years now. I've, I've been with the organization for about 10 of those, um, and we work at the intersection of um, music and um, technology and public policy. Um, doing research, advocacy, and education work um, and trying to make sure that musicians have a voice um, on all the impact issues that impact their lives and livelihoods. Um, and so sometimes that means uh, interfacing with different parts of uh, the federal government, um, both uh, elected leaders in Congress, um, but you know we're not a lobbying organization. Um, we're, um, so we spent a lot of time also talking to regulatory agencies and executive agencies and you know different parts of government and help helping them understand how they can be most helpful to um, musicians out in the field of very varying genres. Um, and now how big? How many? How big is the organization? Because that's another thing I always think about. You hear about these organizations, you think it's a hundred people or something. We're you pretty small. Really I mean, it's, yeah. I, I am the only full-time employee. We have oh wow, yeah. We do have different projects that that scale up or scale down. It's different, different. You know, we bring contractors on, and we've been larger in the past. Um, it's it's you know like the nice thing about being small is that we can pivot quickly, and um, and when we see an opportunity, uh, just sort of jump into it. Um, uh, like, but you know, it's sort of. It has sort of like running running a small public policy organization has an element of that sort of startup hustle all the time, which so it's, it can be a you know and I've got a great team of people backing me up, but it's um, it's a uh, it's a good place to be, um, and you know like because we're small, one of the things that we can do and you know musicians generally in all aspects of business and public policy, they don't typically have a lot of leverage. Um, either commercially or politically, and um, you know, in in the business sphere, um, you know, musicians, various partners, um, labels, publishers, but you know, also streaming services, um, book managers and agents, and um, venues. Like they they may have more. Um, accumulated political capital. Um, so like the only way that we can really make change is through coalitional work. Um, finding common ground with both some of those industry partners, but also folks that are uh, have some common ground in other parts of public policy and advocacy. So sometimes that's labor, sometimes those are civil rights groups, sometimes those are media reform groups. And we just try to be the connective tissue and help folks see where their 
common interests lie and get them connected and collaborative and working together. Okay, so I, cause I've, I've, I've got a, I've definitely got another question about that, but I want to zip back to the start. So you were saying when we, we, when we chatted a couple of days ago that you were going to do this interview from the studio. So does yeah. that mean, did, did you start out as, like, how did you, give me the quick story of how you got to this job. Were you a musician at the start or? Yeah, I mean, I've always been. Um, Not to I've, say that you stopped being a musician or anything. I just more, was that what you were planning on doing? Well, I mean, on some level, um, music and advocacy have always been um, pretty closely intertwined in my mind. Um, you know, like I got into this field back in college. I was um, running my college radio station, playing bands on my college campus and stuff. And then I started booking shows for touring artists that were coming through town and promoting them you know, where, wherever anybody would let me put on a show. And, you know, through the radio work, that was where I first encountered Future Music Coalition because they were doing some of the, I was meeting all of these um, folks on tour and becoming friends with them and realizing that my idea of what it had meant to be a working musician was very different than the kinds of messaging that I was getting through mainstream media, you know, MTV's Cribs, the idea that everybody is just like, yeah. Doing totally rolling in it eventually yeah. Yeah. and then and then right like seeing the lived reality that my new friends were experiencing um and so future of music at the time was doing some of the first research that ever existed on um musicians access to health care um I'm sorry about that um they were doing um, some really important work on radio ownership consolidation, addressing the, um, the, the problem of too few companies having, controlling too many of the radio stations and that leading to a dynamic where it's impossible for local musicians to get any airplay. So yeah, I, I, after, after college, I spent some time um, working various parts of the music industry, running uh, an all ages music venue in a small town um, and continuing to promote shows is also, you know, managing a brick and mortar record shop um, and continuing to make records as a, as a producer. Um, and, uh, you know, through that, through that work, I got involved in an organizing effort that was helping um, organize and share resources for young people who were trying to run all ages venues in their um, in their own communities and learning that um, so many of the folks doing that kind of work kind of feel like they're doing it for the first time if it can be easy to feel really uh, yeah yeah um, but in fact like the challenges that um, the, both the practical challenges and the and the day-to-day -day stuff as well as sort of the systemic things are very common um, you know across uh, from town to town um, from community to community and so the organizing work that I got involved with then was uh, an organization called all ages movement project which was uh, just creating some resources and best practices and like taking what folks had learned um, from doing that kind of work and sharing it. So making it more easy for um, organizers in other cities to build on those successes and avoid the mistakes, right? Um, and, you know, uh, I, I came out to DC um, to, uh, to speak about some of that work at the Future of Music Coalition's conference. This was like 2011, yeah, I think 2011. And um, you know, met met folks out here and started to see. Well, maybe that's the next step. Like talking about federal policy, right? Um, and realizing that like future of music was sort of built on the same idea. It was founded and um, among the co-founders were musicians and independent record label owners who had really worked hard to try and understand how to navigate these complex systems and um, understand how to put together a tour how to put out records, um, you know, even at the, like, here are the addresses for the mastering plants to press your first seven inch record, right? And like taking what they'd learned and sharing it and making it possible for as many people as possible to, to um, 
participate in that kind of cultural production. So and, that's and, our DNA, you know. But 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 I think like also it, it, it you know it was very hard to find the good pressing plants back in the day when there wasn't you know getting a recommendation for certain things was so I like that has always been a problem that artists and labels have always felt very isolated they don't have access to information and right. so and like things on, have changed in terms of technology you know at the time that like w those kinds of things would be communicated through zines and it was primarily about like mail order and you'd like book a tour you know w and send your tour announcements out via postcard some of those things technology has made easier but the basic dynamics um haven't necessarily changed like we still have um a lot of industry systems and practices that are maybe not designed for the the, the little guy you know and so it's, it can be it can feel intimidating it can feel impenetrable but to the extent that you start to learn how to navigate these things um sharing like it's just sort of like documenting what you've learned and sharing it and so we take that same approach to public policy in the process of making um policy change um it's sort of the same idea that like you 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 learn by doing you navigate the systems and the complicated processes um, by jumping right into it with curiosity and humility and then learn as you go and then share share what you're learning um because i think sorry to interrupt but i like what i think is super Inter interesting about that kind of stuff is, is is the fact like what you're saying about like that systemically it sort of works the same because I, I, that's how I feel the, the, this idea that yeah everything's digital but the hustle is completely the same that you know that, that there are all these people interacting together all these different organizations and different organizations that occupy different parts of the I was going to use the word battlefield. I don't know if that's right, but you know the landscape, mm -hmm. and that those dynamics they still there are new areas, but they, the dynamics are are the same. And I think, like, is is that because what I, what I was curious about, like, I read a story about how there's an independent distributor in the UK named called Piast, and I believe they operate in North America, and somebody sent me a link saying that they were forty nine percent purchased by universal in the last two days or something and mm. this is right after right because if anybody knows anything about distribution in the in the uk and europe universal were not allowed to buy any distributors for competition reasons uh for it was something like 10 years or whatever and so like a day and you know two days after they announced this situation and, and is that one of the things that you all are really focused on is fighting against consult like th that there's so much power in too few players hands is that Absolutely. yeah yeah and it is i would actually say in some ways it's gotten worse since the 1990s at the time we would talk about oh there's only six major labels or five major labels and now we're <laughs> yeah. down to three yeah right um and um while it's in some ways easier to get around them and they don't have um the the same kind of the same kind of tight control of markets that they used to uh you know the they have a kind of leverage over the way that the marketplace is shaped that um, smaller and independent artists and smaller independent labels certainly don't have um but yeah i would say that um it's a thread um that's run through all of our work over the years um and increasingly, I think it's kind of the main story that too few companies have too much power and that impacts musicians' ability to reach audiences on the terms that make sense to them. And it impacts their ability to get fair, sustainable levels of compensation for their creative work. Um, we, we've seen it in labels and publishing, but we've also seen it in um the live space and in ticketing you know right now we're we're, we're working on a campaign about ticketmaster and the sort of um uncontested power that ticketmaster has over the live space um so even the biggest artists really don't have a lot of choices um 
or, or alternatives that are meaningfully available to them. We've seen it in broadcasting, as I mentioned, radio, We've, like with the rise in the US of um, iHeartRadio, formerly Clear Channel, just, you know, they bought up all the local radio stations, fired the, the DJs and replaced them with robots. And um, that's pretty futuristic, though. That's a bit of a change. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and it did sort of pave the way for some of the things that are happening on, on streaming, too. And that yeah. instead of a locally focused, like rich, diverse, um, um, humane approach to curation, everything's very algorithm driven and data driven. And so it becomes less about investment in music communities and more about extraction from music communities for the benefit of the largest firms and their investors and the private equity companies that back them. Um, and this, none of this is inevitable. Like th these are all products of uh, public policy choices that have been made over the years and business choices that have been made over the years. And when we understand that they're not inevitable, we also can understand that it doesn't have to stay like that. We can fix these things. Um, Right, but but can, 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 sorry, I, I to interrupt. Again. I've got like one yeah. question because because a lot of this kind of stuff, like you know, like I've worked in music for longer than I care to mention, really. But so, so I understand all this kind of stuff. But say say a musician, say you we're having this conversation, and it's a live event, and somebody comes up afterwards and says, like, great, like Clear Channel, I get it. You know, what's her name? the tickets blow up so and so in Boise, Idaho can't get their five tickets to go see the gig, you know, this is unfair. That's fine, but but Taylor Swift, but how does that affect me? So like what what I think would be really handy is if if you explained how this in an easy way, some easy way like how such such little competition at a very high level even affects people starting out. Can you, is that possible to do? Or have Absolutely. I asked you? Okay. Yeah. Well, so I can, I can start with the live space, for example. So yeah. one of the things that's happened is we've gotten to a place where um, this merged company, Ticketmaster Live Nation, owns and controls more and more of the venues. Yeah. And um, I don't think anybody is sitting up uh, in an office somewhere thinking about, oh, how can I... Um, screw over local music communities, but their decision-making is increasingly data-driven and unable to sort of incorporate local community concerns in the, in the booking processes and, and, and like the, the kind of community-focused cu curatorial approach that independent venues have historically been the ones that have been able to do. And independent venues are finding that they are, um, pressured or even basically threatened that if they don't work with Ticketmaster, um, you know, they might not get those Live Nation tours, they might not get um, access to, the, the, you know, their, their bids that might be rejected, or if they choose not to work with Live Nation, then a Live Nation owned venue is going to open up around the corner and then start undercutting them on, on booking, like even at the community local level and they're starting to reach their their tentacles into smaller and smaller local venues whether they're whether they own the venue or they just have a uh, an operational agreement for, that allows them to basically control it um, and so we see it in the form of uh, fewer options that are available to people at all levels of the the music business, fewer alternatives, you know, like we could have, uh, a, the ideal situation is you have a bunch of different companies that are out there competing for um, folks that hold the, a whole different kinds of career paths and levels of their career. Um, and with consolidation, what happens is things move a one size fits all direction, right? And in music, one size just cannot fit all. Like the diversity of practice is like a core feature of how music careers work and how music industries work because um, there's no way that a cultural system that is primarily built for the purpose of revenue extraction is going to 
be able to equitably or equitably service the people who are not at the top of the pyramid, right? And it doesn't, it, it goes completely against where things are at with the, releasing music. Music, I would say, is becoming more and more diverse because the barriers to entry to releasing music and reaching music that is not through your normal local channels means that people are listening to a lot, like a lot more broad music broadly and broader types of music. So absolutely, there's so much interest yeah. on, on the consumer side in in yeah. ex exploring new parts of 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 our shared musical heritage that they haven't heard before or like exciting new and innovative um, movements and scenes. And yet uh, we increasingly on the sound recording side have economic models that are only really able to be meaningfully remunerative for folks who are able to achieve a mass scale audience. Um, you know, if you compare streaming to physical sales, but also to downloads. You have to just sort of, it puts artists in this position where they're, where they're forced to constantly be chasing after a larger and larger audience. And ultimately that's a system that isn't going to be sustainable for you know, the, the smaller niche genres for people who are making music that's really exciting and progressive, but is not necessarily made for lots of repeat listens or for music that is meant to express the um, particular uh, texture and flavor and values of a particular community, however you define that community. It's, it's, if it, um, it's, it, it, it only really works for, you know, again, like big, uh, big sort of um, primary color pop marketplaces. Um, and so like the way that we fix that is in part is by addressing, you know, the range of market failures and a market um, and, you know, policy failures that got it to that place using the whole range of pu public policy tools that we have. But we also work for the development of uh, a range of alternative models and alternative systems and, um, you know, technologies that are built with the, with small scale artists and the needs of smaller scale artists and local music communities and stuff that's never going to appeal, appeal to arena sized audiences in mind. Um, and, but, 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 like, but I'm wondering, like, so, because I, I think this is what's fascinating about your organization, like, and the, and the U.S. in general, like, this means that you spend a lot of time talking to lawmakers, because there's a lot of rules around this stuff, isn't there? Is that? Right. And, and, which and, is not what I would think for the uh, off first off when I think about the U.S., but is that, is that actually the case? It's absolutely the case that there's, um, um, you know, like like many industries, there's a lot of regulatory structures and licensing systems and copyright systems that over, you know, and as well as like things that happen at the various federal agencies that can shape um, what is or is not possible um, for businesses to do that can shape like what different kinds of businesses obligations are to the um, uh, creators whose work that they're using as well as rights holders whose work that they're using. Um, and a lot of these processes are invisible to somebody who's just, you know, uh, a consumer listening to their favorite stuff on their, their earbuds and, and are, the, the systems by which these decisions are made are not necessarily very accessible. Uh, and unfortunately, that's led to a situation where the laws and policies and decisions that end up governing these structures tend to have historically happened without musicians themselves having a place at the table. Um, and the only way that we fix that is by showing up and claiming that place at the table any way that we can. And that is the best transition ever. 
Because when you show up, what do you show up with? <laughs> you want me to? <laughs> thank That's you, thank, thank you for that. That was the best transition ever. So, you you know, because basically what you're saying is is that you go and talk to politicians, but they these politicians don't aren't as knowledgeable as you are, someone who's worked in and around this stuff for ages. So you you we were talking about how how you <laughs> you found a new system to simplify. The, the the way you explain the music business to people, because how did you explain it? That, 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 that lawmakers are very busy and they they need to, what, what was it? That they need to understand systems in a clear, succinct way. Is that what you were saying? Yeah, I would say that's true. So like, you know, there's there's different populations that you're talking to. There's within some parts of government specialists who, whose job is to focus on a particular issue area and try to understand that small issue area as 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 much as possible with um, in other places, though, and particularly with Congress, you know, the amount of bandwidth that they have to talk and think about music industry issues is very limited because they are getting hundreds of requests for meetings all the time trying to understand you know, what's going on with hundreds of bills that they have to formulate a position on and think about what the right thing to do is. And um, and so for the subset of elected officials who the, the welfare of music, of musicians and music communities is important to them, helping them understand um, the the underlying power dynamics and the uh, most salient details of the options that are available to them as quickly as possible in the limited window that you have is is sort of a, a it's especially challenging because music and music licensing is very complex. Uh, so one thing that we have started to do is um, over the years we've done like posters and visual presentations and things and and flow charts flow charts, flow charts yeah <laughs> here's how the money gets from point a to point b and those have all been really helpful where's um, waldo where's waldo <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> like the process of an audit where's where's, where's, where's our money um <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but the uh Another thing, another thing that we've started doing, and I anticipate that we're going to be doing more, is using um, puppets. We visual like, aids, visual aids, okay. they're called so in the profession, are they not? In 2018, we were working on a piece of legislation called the Music Modernization Act, and it did a lot of stuff. And understanding what it was doing required a, like a baseline level of knowledge about the systems that most members of Congress just didn't have. So they couldn't really uh, even understand what they were voting on. And so we, I had enough people um, in these offices say, can you explain it to me like I'm five? And so <laughs> I, I, I invested in some puppets um, and um, gave the puppets some little hats. So I've like, I've got my artist hat and I've got a, a backup singer hat and you know, just to understand who the different stakeholders were. Um, and those are color, the, the, the hats are color coded, right? So I, right. I'm going to have to do this for anybody who's not watching on video. He's got a series, Kevin has a series of hats that are coded in one color for, is that for yeah. creators? Um, so we did divided it between um, the two copyrights, right? So everybody, oh, okay. this is, and maybe, maybe folks don't know, I can just explain this, but in every piece of recorded music, there are two copyrights in the United States, at least embedded in it. There's the sound recording, which is the, the performance that's captured to magnetic tape or to a hard drive, people playing instruments and you capture it with microphones, right? Um, and uh, money from the sound recording goes to the artist and the sound recording copyright owner, which is often a label, sometimes the artists themselves. And then at the same time, you also have a different copyright, the, um, the musical composition, um, which is like the notes and the lyrics as you could write them out on a piece of sheet music. Um, you know, the, and the royalty generated from uh, musical composition revenue goes to um, the 
publisher and to the songwriter. Now, sometimes a single individual might be uh, operating in multiple roles simultaneously, uh, both like the artist and the publisher, and we'd probably have a hat for the record label if they're self-released. And they're also the songwriter, so we'd have another hat for that. But when you're thinking about how the money flows and how the money gets to the various parties and the decisions that are made about how much money that is and how that's negotiated or whether that happens through a regulatory process, it's important to think through each one of these hats separately. Um, uh, and, and, and so we, we did color code them. We made the hats for the um, sound recording side, this teal color, and then we made the composition hats Red. So is it does that say publish a are you missing uh, I, I think the r might have fallen off <laughs> it's getting so much use it's getting so much use getting a lot of it's either that or publish a's I'll, I'll i'll paste a link in in the the chat so people can look at this but i i would i we did a a briefing uh sponsored by the uh internet caucus i think um a couple of years back um where I, where I was able to bring these puppets out on C-SPAN 2. Um, and, and do you have any of the puppets there? You Do, do you have any of the puppets there though? Oh, I probably do. Yeah. Let, let's get the puppets out just so we have like... Oh, sure. So... <laughs> is that is that Bert? This is, no, this is uh, Ricky, the recording artist. Ricky the... <laughs> Right. Nice alliteration. Uh, <laughs> giving his little hat, and um, and it helps uh, helps sort of walk through who the different roles are. And so, like, if I'm Spotify, I don't. Oh, look at that! I, <laughs> I didn't see those. The recording art artist directly. Instead, I would pay um, the sound recording copyright owner, and I would pay. Um, the MLC for the mechanical royalties, and then I would pay the performance rights organization, BMI or CSAC, for uh, the um, sound recording. And the sound recording money might not go to Ricky, the recording artist, um, but hopefully some portion of the, I'm sorry, the composition money might not go to Ricky, the recording <laughs> You see, he's wearing a different hat, uh, <laughs> yeah. but the, uh, the 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 sound recording royalty hopefully would come to him, although it would be dependent on the terms that he's worked out with his label. Um, it's so like, oh, it, you know, so that, like the thing I think for for people listening, I think what's super important we're we're you know, you know we're or watching and listening, and it's like funny with puppets or whatever, but that C-SPAN video. It was extremely impressive because <laughs> no, but, but but no 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 I but but I'm not, I'm not joking that that first off that you explain some things very quickly, then pass puppets off to the people on either side of you to hold them so you could drill down even further. And I think I I think that is the problem in the like the music ecosystem. It's super super complex. And the things you mentioned when you were talking about who owns what side and all this kind of stuff. I'm thinking, well, that's like basically sinks. It's like people want to know how they get a sink. You know, they need to know all these things. They need to have access to that information. They need to sort of loosely understand these points, like how they get paid, who has to say yes for something. And so like it, as much as the, 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 the puppets are funny and you know, it's also funny to make fun of the fact that you need to use puppets to teach politicians things. It, you know, like, and, and like, I, I, I should say that, like, congressional staffers are very, very smart, uh, but they're just flooded with so much information. So, so, so you, so, so you spend time doing all this kind of stuff, but what, like, what is the common things, because I, I know we were talking about this a couple of days ago, like, what are the common things, like, what do musicians need? Because I think you were also saying that like everybody sort of needs the same stuff. So that your, your organization is in the middle trying to, sh to help people get what they all actually need to, to succeed. 
And what are those things at a high level? Well, so like one way to think about it uh, in terms of what they need in ter- from on, a, on like a, they need access to markets. They need access to audiences. Um, uh, and that what kinds of audiences, what kinds of markets, what kinds of delivery um, and the barriers to that are gonna be different for from format to format, technology to technology, um, you know, recorded versus live. But that's that's gonna be the ability to reach audiences on terms that make sense to them is always gonna be one. And then fair and sustainable levels of compensation for the work that they're doing is another. And then I guess I would also add like there's a bucket of stuff of other stuff that we work on that's just sort of like some of the basic social safety net things that are typically associated with employment, but a lot of musicians don't um, in the United States have like uh, um, access to healthcare, um, unemployment benefits and protections. Um, um, So that's a category of things that we work on as well to like the basic sort of economic justice stuff. But in terms and have of- you succeed, sorry to interrupt, have you succeeded in that area at all? Because I remember there were a couple of years ago, there was a series of articles about how musicians lived having no healthcare. And- yeah, well, so we did the first, um, the first research into the disparities in access in musicians' healthcare, I think 2002. We've done, we did a, a, an additional surveys with some partners and found generally musicians were going without health care at, I think, around three times the rate of the general population. Um, and the general population numbers are also not great. So that's very bad. Yeah. Um, uh, health care reform is not um, something that you that happens with um, just one population um, in mind. Okay. So like yeah. these are big, you know, making changes in those systems are like big, massive uh, undertakings that require work from a lot of stakeholders. But what I think we were able to effectively do is identify some of the systemic barriers that were preventing musicians from having access to healthcare. And, it, and, and often it was because of the employment relationship. We, in the United States, we often tie access to insurance, access to care to a particular employment relationship, whereas musicians typically, um, many of them have uh, multiple employers and multiple gigs and income streams that they're scrapping together. And um, so we took what we learned through that research and brought it to the larger policy conversation so it can inform that and started to see that, yes, this is musicians were the first gig workers, but they're not the only ones. And so this is a this is an economy uh, economy wide problem. And so I think that helped inform the approach that came together with um, the Obama approach to um, health care reform and the Affordable Care Act. And so we have seen some success there um, that, that has, it's not been far from perfect, but we have seen, I would say, thousands of musicians having access to healthcare for the first time in their professional lives. Um, and, uh, you know, there's still problems, the premiums that are too high, the not every plan covers a musician while they're out on tour. And so we're, you know, we're going to continue to participate in those conversations and advocate for, you know, the next steps. Certainly, we would say that the the obvious solution there is um, a state-run system, a single-payer system. Uh, in the U.S., that's been branded lately as Medicare for all, but obviously, the, internationally, there are a lot of good models that have been more successful in ensuring that musicians have that baseline access to care. But we also understand that these are long game fights. This is not something that we're gonna be able to do overnight. Um, it's just working with as many allies as, as we, and again, just claiming a place at the table. Um, I, I've I, also, go, oh, no, go on, sorry. Um, Finish some thought. No, okay, cool. Well, cause um, Miriam, just asked in the chat, have you been involved with the push to get artists paid when their s- songs are played on terrestrial radio? AMS? Oh boy. Have oh, we oh boy, ever. is that a yes? <laughs> have <laughs> like, we ever, yes. I, yeah, I, okay, great. I think, of, 
I sometimes joke about how this is this is this issue is one of our greatest hits because it, <laughs> I've been working on it for you know all twenty years of the organization's history and on on some level and um and we are we there is a bill um, that Congress is considering right now the American Music Fairness Act which would finally solve that problem. Um, to ensure that musicians get get paid when their music is used on on terrestrial radio, um, the way it is in most of the rest of the world, um, and you know that would be um, that would have an impact on musicians who are played on the radio. Of course, it would have an impact on musicians who are played in the rest of the world, where radio airplay tends to be more diverse and adventurous. Um, because it's less consolidated. Um, because right now, musicians um, who get played overseas are not able to collect those royalties often because international artists who get played in the United States are not given those royalties. And through treaties and things, we have these reciprocity obligations, what are called reciprocity obligations. So until we fix it here, um, nobody is getting American artists who are getting played overseas are not necessarily getting getting paid for that even though those countries have better laws than we do here. really so so like if if I, like so your 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 ba your band in the, the US gets played here in Sweden there's public radio you don't you don't get paid that money doesn't flow back to you because iHeartRadio isn't sending money back to me for my space jazz record that got played right. in right. Tallahassee or whatever. That's essentially right. And, and well, there I no, had no idea, had no there, idea. Yeah, so there's some complications wow. because there's, there's a court case happening in the EU where some of these issues have been fought out, but right, basically until we, until we fix it in the US, we, we're not gonna be able to feel confident that artists are getting, getting the money that they've earned. Um, <laughs> And, and, you know, like, again, the, the challenge that there has been that the, the broadcast lobby is super, super power, powerful. I mean, like, artist groups have, you know, little offices tucked away in the corner, like in, in my basement here. Um, the, the, the National Association of Broadcasts has just a huge, huge building full of lobbyists and lawyers that are fighting on this stuff all the time. Um, but I'm, I'm more hopeful than I've ever been on this issue that we're really starting to make some progress in part because we've been able to work with allies in the non-commercial non -commercial radio space and representing the small community stations who have stepped up um, like our friends at the National Federation of Community Broadcasters and Alliance for Community Media who we've worked with on a number of things over the years. And they're increasingly stepping up and saying, yeah, we gotta fix this. This is the right thing to do. Um, the, the big commercial broadcasters should not be claiming to speak for us because we think, we think that the interests of, of broadcasters and musicians really are intimately tied together. And we wanna be, we wanna be on the, the right side of this. Um, so we may actually have a markup um, happening um, in the, house judiciary committee on of this. a bill a markup of a bill yeah right right so they're yeah. going to wow. um you know and it, if if it advances out of that committee and then ultimately goes to the full house i don't know whether that would happen before the end of this congressional term it might have to get reintroduced but it's certainly indicative of real momentum in the right direction so I would also this, say the other thing that's important to understand about this issue is that, like, even if you're somebody who would never get played on the radio anywhere, your music's too weird, or <laughs> yeah. you're just not at that level in your career yet, it's still going to impact what you're able to make. Because when um, I've also explained this with puppets, I don't know where they are, but I'm not going to do okay. it. Yeah. But uh, uh, when and when uh, digital services are engaged in licensing negotiations, if I'm, oh, I've got my hat, at least I can do that. Oh, if there I'm you Spotify, go. Perfect. If I'm Spotify, I can always, and I'm negotiating with record labels and rights holders, I can always say, well, you might not let, like the micro pennies that you're getting from us, but it's better than you'd get from 
terrestrial radio. And if you ask us to pay more, you know, like, or, or, or if you try to like pull your catalog, well, people are just going to go over to terrestrial radio where you'll get nothing. And they're right. Right. So until we fix, huh. until we fix the problems uh, where, where, huge companies are using tons and tons of music and paying the musicians nothing at all. It's gonna be impossible to get the systemic changes to happen on the other competing music platforms. I like, I, okay, like again, I think that's super fascinating because it's like, unless you know all this stuff, it's very hard to see how it's gonna impact you as an artist. And I think it's, you know, and it's important that the, all these things are being driven forward or whatever. But I think that right there within, you know, 20 seconds gives people an idea of it's like, oh, I'm everybody's affected by these, these few changes that could possibly happen. But before we go on what advice you have for artists and stuff, like, it, do, you not, do you not get beat down by this stuff? Like, because I, I felt like in the C-SPAN video, I felt like the, the people who were representing the lawmakers were very interested, very engaged. Uh, I, I was very impressed with all that kind of stuff. But the, it seems like the machine moves so slowly, and then you have these big players with all the lawyers. It, it, do you find it intimidating, or do you find it that that's the hustle now, and and you know what you're doing, and you see progress? Um, I mean, I would say that there's still a There are aspects of public policy work that are very, very common to the experience of being a working musician or a working, you know, creator of any kind. Um, and uh, certainly, like, there's the experience of imposter syndrome, the frustration that you think you've got the best ideas, but you think everybody else is much better resourced than, than you. Um, uh, at the same time, like, I think that some of the skills and ways of thinking that you develop through trying to build a creative career or vocation, you know, even regardless of whether you're trying to make it your full-time gig, like that, kind, it, it helps you work with a kind of long game thinking to be able to simultaneously like identify the opportunities and um, challenges that are immediately in front of you, but also be thinking about like, okay, long-term, where are we going with this, right? Um, uh, and, and like, that's how policy gets made. Like it's a, there's this old, um, uh, uh, people have described the like politics as, or, or policy making as the slow, slow boring of old boards. Like, like you just, it's, <laughs> it's, a lot, it's just, it's a lot of very um, slow, methodical work over time. Even the analogy doesn't sink in that quickly <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Uh, hard hard yeah it's it's hard <laughs> slow and boring sometimes and yeah pun so, pun pun so is, so, i mean like so is touring right like yeah. we're, we're equipped for this kind of stuff and and if you can look at it through like okay you're not necessarily you're doing the work right now you have to on some level trust that um you're going to see some reward from it further down the road. It might take 10 years before the work that you're putting in right now pays off. So you wanna make sure that you're not burning yourself out and you're not um, miserable while you're getting to that point. But you know, to the extent that we've gotten our own bills passed where we were one of the primary drivers, you know, it takes 10 years. Yeah. And wow. um, you know, that, that's, that's okay. That's a, that's a threshold we can work with. It's like slow cooking, like it, it, it's worth the wait. So one of the things we talked about a lot when um, we spoke earlier in the week was it's like, it's sort of like I always say that like artists, they want to know like, what can they do? And 
we've talked about all this heavy stuff in a way that maybe if you don't really know, if you're new to the game, like you don't really know all the parts. So it's like, like, what do you have for advice? Like what, knowing that it, to me, it feels good that you're over there doing what you're doing because you're embedded in it. You're realistic about what's happening. You're very articulate about explaining to the right people who need to know. But what can, what can artists be doing to make it better for themselves immediately, knowing that this complexity is, is some of it might not get worked out in the next 10 years? Like, what do you recommend? You must talk to artists all the time. So, I, I mean, I do. And, you know, if nothing else, they're free, frequently just friends on Twitter crashing on my couch. And um, uh, I think one of the main things is to just make it part of your practice to show up and engage. Um, and, uh, you know, like I would say that especially like because of the pandemic, a lot of our work has been more lawmaker focused and policymaker and, um, and, and less about pushing the messaging out to the artist community. We're gonna start, that's gonna start to, to change in the next couple of months as we're rolling out some new educational materials and things. And so I would say, look, be on the lookout for that because we're gonna have more concrete ways to engage. Um, but I would say generally, uh, showing up, you know, just like, if you're uh, like, if, if you want to have a role in the conversation, the first thing that you have to do is show up and be part of the conversations. And even if you just, that just means listening at first, um, that if that just means, okay, I'm going to watch this congressional hearing and try and understand what's happening. And then, you know, like you start to, to, navigate how it works. If you think, I mean, if you think of it the same way that you think about like how you learned to book your first tour, uh, you know, you talk to people who are doing it, you ask for advice and ask questions, you look for the opportunities, um, you watch what your your peers are doing and, and then you just kind of show up. Um, uh, but you also mentioned, I forgot about this, like, you know, because I come from, like back in the day, it used to be called DIY, but you call it, what, what is it, do it together, is what you, you, you know, because yeah. I thought that was a really valuable, I never even thought of it that way, that, that, that like you were saying with the venue side of things, that people, they think they're doing stuff, it's the first time for them, so they think they're doing it, everybody's doing it for the first time, but actually people have been going through this for ages, so learning to exchange information. Like, how do new artists learn to exchange information when they don't know anything? Yeah, I mean, like, so, yeah, so I, it does require sort of a shift in your thinking away from, I think, I think like, you know, I, 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 my own practice as, as a participant in music communities comes out of the what I, I think would also be broadly termed the DIY culture that that flourished in, in in the 90s and like sort of has continued to have important ripple effects. But one way that the conversation around that is is different now where it was compared to where it was then is that there was sort of an understanding that DIY was in a context of a, of a interconnected community. And DIY now, I think, you know, for technological reasons and for a variety of for a variety of reasons, has more of an entrepreneurial bent. There's nothing wrong with entrepreneurship, of course, that's that's fine, but it can't be the only frame through which you're thinking and looking at these issues, right? So if you think about um, the choices that are made, uh, that are available to you about how you're going to do your business and how you're going to, um, like what, what kind, like how you're going to go about playing shows, putting out records, not, not entirely from like, um, the like individualist hustle, but in seeing that work as embedded in a shared community of, peers and values that you're 
that are your allies in this, not just your competitors. Um, to see, I'm mean, seeing other musicians as 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 comrades, if you're going to use that language, or as as um, fellow workers in a in a collective struggle for more equitable and just systems. Um, that right, so that that helps you move away from do it yourself to do it together that helps you move away from individual action as the 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 place where you, you're able to advance your interests to collective action working together so i think i think it's also important to and we're not a membership organization there are some membership organizations that that speak to the needs of different communities that are out there so getting involved in in those is also a, a great thing to do um looking for opportunities like um, to um, work uh, work together with allies and and um, and organize together to sort of identify what the most pressing needs that you're facing and and find ways to make change together. Um, and then also just like proceed with curiosity, proceed with the assumption that you are not the first people that have experienced these dynamics and, and like look around, look at the whole array of music organizations that are out there and see if, if, if somebody's working on it, if there's something that you can plug into, if nobody's working on it, um, take the initiative and show up and lead the way. Also a little proceed with caution though. Don't you think like you gotta be, you don't, you want to make sure you don't get stuck in any situations you can't get out of. I, th I think, isn't that what a lot of our artists worry about today? Contractual stuff. Yeah. Right. And, and, and well, so like in terms of like individual con contractual arrangements and, and business deals, I would say that absolutely. Uh, Yes, be careful, um, be methodical, talk to a lot of people, ask questions of, of peers that are maybe a few years further down the road in terms of their own um, artistic path. Uh, musicians, I would say generally are pretty generous about sharing what they've learned, um, both their successes and their, their mistakes. I would say that um, there are also good resources um, out there. Um, so if you are not in a place where you can afford an entertainment lawyer to look over a contract that a record label or a publisher has offered you, make use of, um, in the United States, we have volunteer lawyers for the arts, um, and they've got all their state chapters, and that's basically what they do on a free sliding scale basis, um, is help, help people um, make sure that they're not getting ripped off. Um, uh, and then like the other, the other side of that is to like, as you learn things, be, uh, open and generous care. with your knowledge, give it right. back, give it back. Yeah. 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 I didn't even think of that one. That's good. <laughs> like you have to give back to get, you know. Yeah, okay. I mean, so much can be so much grief can be saved. Like if if, if somebody has a terrible experience with um, a a particular um, business partner and they keep it to themselves, it it you know it allows that dysfunction to continue un, unaddressed. So you know, share share sharing both our like positive experiences with partners as well as negative ones. Sharing um, sharing the successes and the the struggles. All right, that's cool. Like, do you want to throw your details in the chat in case anybody want, wants to get a hold of you? Sure. Because I think that I will do that. Um, but but I, like that, it's super. That was super interesting. Like that thing about the spotted Spotify royalties. It was really fascinating to me. Like how I'll have a video coming out with the puppets um, sometime <laughs> in the next couple of months, where we're going to go deeper on all. Do you? The big question is: Do you have a YouTube channel for your puppets? That's that's really what we need to know. We have a YouTube channel. We have not really. We mostly have just used it for our um, 
uh, old conference footage and uh, some webinars that we've. Uh, no, 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 short <laughs> videos with the puppets. Well, the, puppet, the puppet videos are on the way and we will be. <laughs> really? All right, good. We will be multi-platform uh, with them. We'll be putting them on um, YouTube and Facebook and TikTok and Twitter and everywhere else. But uh, oh, we good. also will be um, relaunching an up-to-date website in the next couple of weeks here too. So if you if you check out our web presence right now and you're like, oh my God, this is from ages ago, you're correct. Um, but uh, we're about to remedy that. So okay. I will drop that in the chat here as well. Okay, brilliant. Well, look, thanks so much. It was awesome to talk to you. And for those who are listening to audio only, you got to watch the video because it's all about the hats and the, even just the hats helps. You don't even need the dolls. It's the moving the hats around. Brilliant. So thanks so much. Um, everybody grab those links in the chat to the C-SPAN video. It's super interesting. Um, and then uh, thanks again, Kevin. It was brilliant. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for having me. This, is, this has been lots of fun. Oh, it's been brilliant. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you soon. See you later, all. See you later, Monica, Hans, Sharon.